So we're looking at factor remainder theorems here. These can get pretty heavy duty, but it's actually a very simple concept. Take the number 7 and divide it by 3. Now what would you get? You'd get the number 2 with a remainder of 1. Now I can express this relationship in a particular way. A little bit like this. I can say that 7 is equal to 3 times 2, the divisor, times the quotient, the answer, plus the remainder. Alright, so that's numbers. We can do exactly the same with polynomials. If I have polynomial x squared plus 5x minus 2 and I divide it by x plus 1, I'll get a quotient of x plus 4 and a remainder of negative 6. And I can express that in the following way. The polynomial we started with is equal to the divisor times the quotient minus 6. And you can expand that out and I promise you, you'll get this. Now, we can um, make this a little more general in the following way. If we take p of z and divide it by d of z, we'll get q of z plus r of z. Uh, and that is the important formula here, and that's where we're going to get our factor of remainder theorems from. Now, the important, important first result here is that if r of z is 0, if the remainder is 0, that means that d of z, the divisor, was a factor of p of z. And so is q of z, right? Because multiplying those two together give us p of z. So this and this is a factor of that if that equals zero, if that's not there. So now that we've established that, we can talk about something called the remainder theorem. So the remainder theorem states the following. Let alpha be some number, complex or real, doesn't matter, but anywhere in that space. When um, pz is divided by z minus alpha, then the remainder is equal to p alpha. Now, whew, that's a big lot of words and doesn't really make a lot of sense. If I show it to you, it'll make perfect sense. So you should remember this from about two minutes ago. Uh, x squared plus 5x minus 2 divided by x plus 1 gives x plus 4 with a remainder of negative 6. And when we look at our remainder theorem here, it says when p of z, that's p of z, is divided by z minus alpha, this is z minus alpha here. I should really have z's everywhere. That's better. So when I do that, the remainder should be equal to p alpha. So let's see if that's true. I know that my remainder was negative 6, but it also, if pz was equal to my original thing here, z squared plus 5z minus 2. If I now sub in alpha, I should get a remainder of negative 6. Now you need to be careful here because is divided by z minus alpha. So if I'm dividing by z plus 1, then my alpha is not 1, it's negative 1. So Let's find out what p negative 1 is. No surprises here. The answer is negative 6. So p negative 1 is negative 6. So what's the upshot here? Well, it means that you can sub values in to your equation to find out what the remainder is when you do the division. And I don't know about you, but I think it's much easier to sub values into functions than it is to do uh, polynomial division all the time to find out remainders. So that's what our remainder theorem states. If you want to find out the remainder, you can put alpha straight into your equation. Now that thing was an example. It wasn't proof. If you want proof of the remainder theorem, really straightforward. Take this equation and bring it down here. Now that we've done that, we know in our remainder theorem, we're dividing by z minus alpha, so let's put that in for our divisor. And now what we have is the function pz in this form here. And I want to prove that p alpha is equal to the remainder. So why don't we write this now as p alpha. Now that just means I'm going to sub in alpha for z everywhere. And you hopefully can see that this is the end of the proof, really, because what we've done is said alpha minus alpha. Well, that's going to be a big zero there. And zero times the quotient is going to be zero, which means that P alpha is just equal to what's left there, uh, alpha. All right, that's the proof. That's the remainder theorem. The stuff there is how it actually works. Now, the factor theorem follows very neatly from the remainder theorem. Again, alpha is in the complex numbers, real or, or, imagined, or complex. Now, z minus alpha is a factor of pz if p alpha is equal to zero. Why would that be the case? It's because we know that p alpha is equal to the remainder. So if p alpha is equal to zero, then the remainder is zero. And if the remainder is zero, 
then we have a factor. Uh, we can say that if the remainder is zero, then we have a factor. And the upshot of this, and something you've done before, is that if you want to find a factor of anything, you can just sub values into it until the answer is zero. So you can sub one into that and say one cubed plus one squared plus four is six. No, one's not a factor. You can sub negative one in there and try that. Da, da, da. No, that's not going to work. You can sub two in negative two, three, negative three, until it spits out the number zero, which is what you want. Now, I happen to know that if I sub in a special value, that being negative two, if I put negative two in there, I'll get an answer of zero. And so what can I say? I can say that a factor of this is definitely z plus 2. Because remember, it's got to be the reverse of the thing that you started with. So now that I have z plus 2 as a factor, I could do some polynomial division here. And once I do that polynomial division, I can now say that pz can be factorized as z plus 2 times whatever my answer was there z squared minus z plus 2. Now, can I factorize that further? Uh, maybe, probably not. Um, but that's as far as I want to go right here because I just wanted to show you the factor and remainder theorems and a little bit of polynomial division. If you don't know that, you've got to practice it. All right, that's it.